I've been talking a little bit lately about how I've spent a bunch of time working on computer stuff. And I've mentioned to a couple of the commenters that I've been setting up a new computer, and it's not something I really enjoy that much. But uh, what I do enjoy is and being able to do some neat things. And I've spent a lot of time, as I mentioned earlier, with Adobe Premiere Pro. And fact is, I've been getting real interested in, in a lot of really cool software that Adobe offers. I'm sure a lot of companies offer cool stuff, but there's a lot of really good stuff in some of their creativity suite that they have, you know, with Lightroom and, and uh, Photoshop and After Effects and things like that. So I've been spending a bunch of time trying to learn that stuff, get my arms around that stuff. And in order to run that that kind of software effectively, one kind of needs a muscular computer. And the one I had was was working out pretty well with, you know, some of the other software I'd been using, like PowerDirector and stuff. It kind of worked on there, as and I mentioned the troubles with that before, but Adobe Premiere Pro ran just fine on my other computer, but when I started putting other stuff onto it, it would start to run into some trouble. So let me show you what I got. Here's the setup here. It, it's a, uh, a Lenovo ThinkPad P70 mobile workstation, which is like a, a, uh, a laptop on steroids. It's built heavier, it's built better. Um, th this thing has, I mean, gobs and gobs of memory. And I've been uh, kind of paying attention to what other people are doing with sound and things like that, and I'm trying to learn from that. Sound is a tough deal if you're making video. Sound is actually harder to do than the video part. And so, you know, I've, I've done just like Buzz suggested. I, he had a Blue Yeti, and I picked up a Blue Yeti, and it's pretty cool. I like it, but it is big and heavy. So I watched a video that Buzz did lately, and he used one of these, the, Sam, uh, the Samson Meteor, which, man, I... I bought one too and I really dig it. It's a nice little mic. And I invested a bit in some some hard drive to you know to store some of the videos and things because if you know heaven forbid if the laptop were ever stolen or you know they take up a lot of space so I don't want to eat up memory space in the laptop. So the cool thing about hard drives these days is that they're really cheap. So you can buy like this this guy here is is a uh, uh, I think it's a three terabyte. I have to look. I know this one is a seven terabyte, and you know, one this was like a hundred dollars. This is like a hundred fifty bucks. I mean, they're they're cheap these days. You think about what you can store on them, so it's pretty cool. Bring the two pieces together. This is hard to do freehand, but I'm going to have to try it because I can't find any way to clamp this. So you. Hold them together like so until until they set, and you have to put some pressure on them. And this is the hard part right here. Well, guys, I did it again. I'm moving videos around as I'm getting used to using the new video editing software. Yeah. But the problem is I deleted a video that I hadn't yet put into a project, and that video is the one I'm, I'm about to discuss right now. So if you remember from my last um, installation in this little series, the, little, the, the smaller of the two O-rings didn't really work. It kept coming up out of the groove and it wasn't going to stay in place and I could just tell it wasn't going to work out well. So I decided to try a different approach. And I'm using a kit that Radio Days sells that you can use to make your own dial belts. And it uses some square cross-section rubber belt that you cut to the right length and you, of course you bevel the ends so that you get a, a, a larger surface area and I'll show you, you'll see what that looks like in the video. And then you super glue the ends together and I'll be darned, super glue holds rubber really well and you cannot get it apart. You'll tear the rubber before you'll break the super glue bond. And so it works great. And so I made a small square cross section ring to, to use for this little wheel. Now, it's, it's sort of like making a tire for a record player idler wheel, which is what I've done with this stuff in the past, too. So I'm going to go ahead and show you this. Where the video picks up now is where I've just cut one, and I'm getting ready to glue it together. So you haven't missed much. I just needed to explain what I'm up to, and let's proceed with the job. So I have my doubts about this one. Seems to be holding, though. You can see I cut it at a net, a bevel right there. You know, I took a piece, 
at it roughly the right length, cut it at a bevel at an angle there. And then you put a little drop of the super glue. And this is what I use right here is Loctite super glue. All right. And you put a little drop on each side, on each, each of the two surfaces that you're going to glue. And then you push them together. You kind of rub it around while it's still not set. And you kind of get it spread. And you really going to, you want a thin layer between the two pieces once you get done with that. And then you hold them as tight as you can, but aligned together for a minute, at least a minute. Now what I do is I wear these nitrile gloves and I hold them together and I use that, my fingers to help align it because it won't stick to the nitrile very well. And so I can peel the gloves off when I'm done and then I have a pretty good bond. And I can pull on this and that, won't, that will not come apart. What I will also do is super glue this to that little knurled wheel when, it's all, when I'm ready to do that. But I've got to get all this silicone cleaned off of here before I can. I think this rubber wheel is going to work fine. So let me get that silicone cleaned off. I'll come back to you. Now I'm going to take a little, little rough sandpaper and kind of smooth that part out. Um, and we'll see if it fits on the wheel first. So let me do that. And uh, we'll see. I may have made it too long. I bet I did. No, I didn't twist it. It's maybe too long. Let me try this in here just for grins. I mean, I've already assembled it. I might as well try it. Can't, can't, do, can't go too far wrong just by trying it. And if the concept works, then I'll just make another one, make it shorter. See, sending this off, it turns out to not be an option because it's going to take too long and I don't have the amount of time it's going to take. In concept, that works. We just need to make it big and make it tighter. Okay, I have the wheel cleaned up pretty well. It looks rougher than it is. Um, but, you know, I think we can live with that. Now I'm going to take a little piece of coarse sandpaper and just smooth out that, that joint, that seam. You don't have to do much. You just sort of smooth it out a bit because you don't want to really feel a rough spot there when you're tuning the radio. But you don't want to remove a lot of material either because you don't uh, you want this thing to work properly and be round. There, that's all I want to do. That's nice and tight. It's not going to come loose and I can make another one. Now it's not as wide as the other one, but that's okay. That's not a big deal. That wheel is plenty wide, wide enough, the little knurled wheel. So I'm going to go ahead and mount this in the radio or in the uh, tuning condenser assembly. Is you make sure the knob is pulled to the sort of out position a little bit. You don't want to pull the knob out of the chassis, but it won't hurt it if you do. You just push it back in. Okay, let me show you where I'm talking about. Right, right there, you want to be a little careful. You know, you're going to wind up wanting to pull that out of there when you pull this up. But when you pull this up, it makes room to get that wheel in easily. I'll show you. You want to take the wheel, and you see how it's oriented with the friction discs toward the knob. You just push that up in the hole at the top part here. And take the other end and put it down in the hole and see how that drops right in. All right, now that that's dropped right in, it's really pretty easy. You just take this screw, put it in, get it started. Get these screws in there. And uh, that's it. That's all you have to do. Just tighten these down. Hmm. Okay, this thing does not want to go tight. That might be why it was loose when I took it apart. So what I'm going to have to do, put a little bolt in there, uh, probably one of my small ones, and a nut, and that I'll, I'll have to screw that down. Okay, I've grabbed a uh, little 440 screw with a 
for the nut. I've got a lock. It's one of those nylock nuts. Okay, so let me show you how this looks now. There you go. That's the course right there. Nice, huh? All right. That'll work fine. If I want to operate it in fine. There we go. You know what? That works pretty well. And then to put it on course again, it's better if you turn it while you engage it. It's sort of like shifting your transmission in your car. You're not going to you're not going to throw it in gear from a dead stop. It's just because the gears if they don't mesh, they they won't go together so easily. So you kind of want to turn it while you do it. There's a little detent on this shaft. You turn it, and that's what that's all there is to it. There's the detent right there. That's what causes that detent. All right, that little spring there. Pull it out and meet the other detent. Nothing to it. All right, I think we got this thing nailed. What I am going to do is put a little drop of super glue on all this, on you know, along this edge of the coarse rubber wheel, and then I'm going to slide that wheel toward the front. And if it doesn't hold it, it doesn't hold it. It's not the end of the world. I'm going to try it. Sort of like putting oil on a tuning condenser. I just want to get down here along this side here. I'm going to put it on two or three in two or three places, and I'm going to slide that the rubber band here just toward this that flange. If it doesn't hold, well, I haven't really lost anything. But if it does hold, well, then it'll maybe make that work a little better. Make it give me better engagement. See what's happening is it's running up into the grooves of those knurls. All right, so let me wipe off my screwdriver. Now, let's try this. And then I won't operate it till this stuff cures. You see what I'm doing, right? With super glue, what super glue requires is time and pressure. So I'm, every, all the places I put the glue, I'm just putting a little pressure on it for 15 seconds or so, and then moving on to the next one, the next spot. Okay, until I get that basically to adhere all the way around. Now, the super glue will be liquid until, you know, in, in all the places where there isn't, where it's not being squeezed. And, by the way, this will help keep that, uh, the uh, seam that I made from coming apart. If I can get this to adhere to the wheel itself. Remember, guys, this is all experimental for me, too. I've never done one of this kind before. But the cool thing about radios, which is not exactly the case for most old cars, is just about anything can be made to work with standard garden variety stuff you can find anywhere. Yeah, see, now you can see that little bead of super glue there. That will dry and harden. It'll take some time. It will dry and harden. It's already curing where there's pressure, you know, where the two surfaces meet. That's when super, that's where super glue will cure. It might remain wet there for a long time where it's not actually touching and where it's not actually being squeezed. I think it's like Loctite um, thread lock that it requires the absence of oxygen for it to actually work. Because that's how Loctite works. Okay, so I'm going to leave that alone for a bit. Um, you can mess with things too much, and I'm afraid I'm in jeopardy of doing that if I mess with it anymore. So, let me set this aside. And I have some capacitors to get replaced, so I'm going to put my stuff away here. Always close your super glue up tight. 
I'm going to put my stuff away and get on to those capacitors. Many times I've made reference to checking resistors before removing them, but I've also commented lots of times that most of the time I pull the dog bones out. But dog bones look so cool, man. Why would I want to replace that? put in something modern that doesn't look nearly as neat as that thing does. Well, I'll tell you why. If you use the body end dot convention to read the resistance on this, which is how you're supposed to do it, so it's, um, the, the body is red, the end is blue, and the dot is yellow. So what we have is 26 times 10 to the 4th, so 260K. This thing is supposed to measure 260K. Now you see I've pulled one end loose from the terminal and I'm checking resistance. Let's see what we got for our resistance. There we go guys, 355.7K. This is supposed to be a 260K resistor. That's why I pull it out of there. And so far in this radio, just about every one of these has been high in that, that sort of magnitude. You know, if it's in the hundreds of Ks, well, then it's high by 100K or more. And if it's in the tens of Ks, it's high by about 15K or more. So uh, these things all have to come out. This will screw up the radio. It'll make it difficult to, to uh, troubleshoot. And it just the radio just won't work well with resistors that are that far off. One of the first things I like to check, uh, even though I've never had one, personally I've never had one fail, is the Candome. Um, voltage dividing resistor so let me uh, it's got the ground here in the middle so I'm going to measure resistances from from this point this point and this point to that point and from this point and this point to that point this guy right here is uh, electrically connected to this long strip this framework which is electrically connected to the chassis so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to solder this back on there so I don't lose track of it. And then I'll just desolder uh, as many of these as I need to to take that measurement. So let me, let me put that back. I don't need a half a pound of solder on there either. I don't need to get it that hot. I just need a little bit. Just enough to make that a secure electrical connection. There. Okay. So... Let's do that first off because I don't want to get wires mixed up. They're all black. So <laughs> that's a real problem. If I have a whole lot of wires disconnected at once, I can't exactly say, well, it's where the black wire was. Um, that won't help me. So John from Arkansas once worked on a radio. I don't remember if it was a Halicrafters or a Hammerland or a National. It was, I think it was a boat anchor. No, no, it was that old airline he was working on. Anyway... Um, I think he put all white wires in it, which intrigued me. I mean, I, I get why, why you would do that, but boy, it sure makes troubleshooting hard, John. I wonder, I wonder, you know, what you think of that. I'm curious. If you're paying attention, you hear Buster there. Buster's come into the room. There we go. Now, very quickly, uh, let me disconnect this guy. So, and there, it, this black wire, <laughs> this wire goes over to this uh, IF tube, and then it goes off to this IF tube and goes through this capacitor. Why does that keep changing? Let me check this one. I don't know why they do that. See how it's drifting like that? So I get a real solid number there. I get 24.6. And the schema says it's supposed to be 20. So that, that's cool. I can dig that. So let me write that down. All right, so let me measure this one over here, over to here. 268.0, Schemo says, ooh. 
Schema says 226, or that's weird, 225. I'm getting 268, and it's supposed to be 228. Oh, no, Schema says 225. I'll show you for that section of resistor. And then if I'm supposed to add the, the 20, um, I get 245. Now I'm reading 268. That's not awful. Let me measure it here. Yeah, 244. So, okay, 244 here. So that side is good. All right, so I'm not sure what the heck is going on with the rest of this. Let me measure this. We get here. See how that changes? Not sure why that is. Am, am I just being stupid? Let me remove this lead and just see what's going on there. Now remember guys, this radio was playing. I think there's a problem in this can dome. If I hold this terminal real tight one direction, it reads one number nice and solid. If I hold it real tight another direction, it reads another number fairly solid. It settles in on one. But if I just let it go, it just sort of floats there. Make sure it's not me touching and grounding through me. Now, uh, see, 13.92 solid. 13, yeah. Let me see if it's, maybe measure this one. Yeah, see that settles in too. 8.35. Well, that drifts too. There is a problem with continuity in that candle. So this may be the first one I've ever run into that has failed. Those of you that, yeah, look at that. See that? They're connected. Both of them are connected solidly. And it settles down until I start moving it. See that? Yeah. Well, I'll be damned. I have never had a bad candle before this, and I was just preaching that they don't go bad very often for me. <laughs> and just when I preach that, I run into one that's got problems. See that? That's not good. All right, guys. Well, I guess I know what I need to do. This, uh, this candle has got to go. All right. So I've got one... One, two, three, four, five resistors to put on this bugger. Shouldn't be hard. I mean, the only problem is that these will be fairly high wattage resistors. I mean, this is right in the uh, right in the power supply. All right. Well, I got a little math to do. Okay, guys, this video is going to get too long if I don't uh, cut it short now. So what I'll have you do is I've got some ideas on what to do about this, um, this voltage divider. And I'm going to go ahead and build one. And so if you'll check back with me in, in part three, actually I think it's going to be part four. If you'll check back with me in part four, you'll see what I come up with. Until then, it's uh, really late on Sunday night. It's actually Monday morning now. And uh, I'm going to close it down. So from your western outpost in Salt Lake City, this is Michael, and that's all for now.